to introduce someone who has carried on the legacy of her father and has carried on the best of what represents not just a, America's ideals and values, but humanity's. Always in her own voice and with her own sense of purpose. Since the ripe old age of 17, when she spoke at the United Nations about apartheid, it has been clear that Reverend Bernice King was put on this earth to preach. Since that day, she has used the power of the spoken and written word to inspire young people to build bridges of understanding between citizens of all races, to tackle the lingering evils of racism and poverty throughout the world, and to give to all people a faith that they too can work to make her father's dream a reality in their own lives. So it is with a great deal of pleasure and honor that I introduce the Reverend Bernice King. I first and foremost uh, want to give all praise to God and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for this opportunity and the Holy Spirit for giving me the strength and the power to stand. To President Clinton, to First Lady Hillary Clinton, to President Mandela and Mrs. Michelle, to Ambassador Son and Ambassador Joseph, and to all of you distinguished brothers and sisters, I must admit that this is indeed a great honor and a privilege for me this moment to be in the presence of a lot of greatness. Great political leaders, great educational leaders, great uh, religious leaders, men and women of God, great bishops and prognosticators of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but especially to be in the pre presence of the person of President Nelson Mandela who in many ways epitomizes the essence of who my father was. And so I thank God for this privilege and opportunity to be in his presence. And to say just a few brief words, I was asked to say a few brief words, and I don't think they realize, but they ask a Baptist preacher to say <laughs> a few brief words. And I'm going to try to, to follow a little bit of the protocol as much as possible. As I look upon President Mandela, and think also of my own father, I'm reminded of the powerful words of that great abolitionist and beloved statesman, Frederick Douglass, who said, where there is no struggle, there can be no progress. Both of these men, in their struggle against racist regimes, were critical in the social advancement of the human race. And President Mandela's presence here evokes many memories for me, in particular of my experience when I was privileged to attend his inauguration several years ago. As I traveled to South Africa, I must admit that I was on one mission, a singular mission, because I wanted to better understand how a man who had spent 27 years in prison was really doing. At that time, it had been my entire life. And so I could not even imagine being imprisoned for 27 years, all of my life. And as I traveled there, I was looking for signs, in fact, of bitterness and, and anger. And as I looked at him and listened to him give his inaugural speech, because uh, God has gifted me sometimes with the spirit of discernment, I asked God to allow me to see into the heart of this man. And God allowed me to be able to see that there were no traces of bitterness and anger after 27 years of being imprisoned, I believe, unjustifiably so. And that indeed is awesome, to say the least. 
And as I thought about it, I thought about my father's words, that unearned suffering is redemptive. I thought about even the words of Jesus Christ or the experience of Jesus Christ, that you must first go through the crucifixion by way of the crucifixion in order to get to the resurrection. And I experienced a powerful uh, resurrection of sorts as I watched and listened to President Nelson Mandela. No one can deny that his suffering helped to redeem and transform South Africa. For indeed, the personal suffering that he endured, coupled with the personal transformation that I'm sure he underwent, became the fuel that transformed and embattled South Africa into a reconciling South Africa. This reconciliation has been characterized by love and an indomitable spirit of forgiveness and understanding which President Mandela carried into his leadership as the president of the new South Africa. We've witnessed his powerful spirit of forgiveness, his powerful spirit of understanding and reconciliation, as he even invited his own jailers to his inauguration, and as he set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in that country. I often think what it would mean if this nation would follow that example and set up its own. If we would set up our own Truth and Reconciliation Commission so that we can continue the unfinished reconciliation work of my father, Martin Luther King, Jr. Certainly we have a great need for healing and reconciliation in this country. And it begins with forgiveness. And now I have the distinguished honor of presenting our president. And I realize that tonight is not about our president's dilemma. But I wish to briefly say and go on record as such that our Judeo-Christian heritage calls for us to allow God to handle the matter, remembering how he handled King David. For when King David was confronted with his own sin by the prophet Nathan, King David was heard to say, in similar fashion as our president has been heard to say, I have sinned against the Lord. And the prophet remarked back, the Lord also has put away your sin. Yes. David remained king. King, while God fine-tuned both his circumstance and his perspectives, God sheltered him as he purged his appetites and made clear the devastating consequences of returning to the old path. Ultimately, God is the searcher of all men's hearts. And I know a little bit about God, just a little bit. And I know that he can handle his business. And he can handle it alone, for he's God, and he's God all by himself. And he doesn't need anyone's help. And so, Mr. President, because I know that none of us is perfect, 
because we have all, everybody, everybody, from the highest to the lowest, from the news media to Capitol Hill, we have all, from pulpits to the pews, we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so I, and I believe there are many others in this room who forgive you. And I wish to say that it's time, I think, for us to leave our president alone. him alone, we are leaving him in trusted hands. We're leaving him in the hands of an able God who shaped, fashioned, and created him and can adequately correct and fully restore him. For God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or even think. And we're also leaving him alone to his family who will help in the healing process. And I close with this and bring the president on. Words of the Holy Scripture that speak this way out of the book of Colossians. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. God is beckoning us, I believe, all of us in the world at large, this nation and his people, to repent, forgive that we might be forgiven by him and he might speak to us and heal our land. I introduce a great leader, a great world leader, as we witnessed again on yesterday, and a great statesman, our president, President Clinton. Let us receive. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. I was sitting here thinking, uh, in this case, I wish I were on the giving rather than the receiving end. It is, all, it is difficult uh, to absorb the depth and breadth of what I have heard and what you have given to me through the words of uh, Reverend King and through 
your expression, and I thank you. I thank you also for what you have given to our country. I thank the members of Congress and the administration, the educators, the ministers, the ambassadors, all of you who are here and our friends from South Africa. Uh, Hillary and I are delighted to have President Mandela and Gracia here. We thank you, Gracia, for your concern for the children who have been made victims of war by being impressed into combat as children and the scars they was bear from it. And we thank you, Mr. President, for being the person we'd all like to be on our best day. Yes. The, uh, I would like you all to think for a few moments before I bring uh, President Mandela on. Not about the terrible, unjust sacrifice of his 27 years in prison, but about what he's done with the years since he got out of prison. Not about how he purged his uh, heart of bitterness and anger while still a prisoner, but how he resists every day the temptation to take it up again in the pettiness and meanness of human events. In some ways, that is all the more remarkable. I, there have been many blessings for Hillary and for me, far outweighing all the trials of being given the opportunity by the American people to serve in this position and live in this house. But certainly one of the greatest ones has been the friendship of this good man. And I want to tell you one little story. I try never to betray any private conversations I have with anybody, but I want to tell you this. <laughs> I, uh, when President Mandela, uh, once I was talking to him, and I, I said to him, you know, I, I have listened carefully to everything you have said, to how you laid your anger and your bitterness down. But on the day you got out of prison, Hillary and I were living in Arkansas in the governor's mansion. Our daughter was a very young girl. I got her up early on a Sunday morning. And I sat her down on the counter in our kitchen because we had an elevated television. And I said, Chelsea, I want you to watch this. This is one of the great events of your lifetime. And I want you to watch this. And she watched President Mandela walk down that last road toward freedom after all those years in prison. So I said to him one day, I said, now tell me this. I know you invited your jailers to the inauguration, and I know how hard you've worked on this, but weren't you angry one more time when you were walking down that road? He said, yes, briefly I was. I don't know if he remembers it. He said, yes, briefly I was, and then I remembered, I have waited so long for freedom, and if my anger goes with me out of this place, I will still be their prisoner, and I want to be free. I want to be free. I say that. I say that to set the stage for what is now happening in Nelson Mandela's life. Yesterday we were at the United Nations and he and I spoke back to back and then we had this luncheon and, and uh, we were talking about the troubles in the Congo. We were talking about the continuing, almost compulsive destructiveness of the people there and all the countries outside trying to get into the act to make sure that whoever they don't like doesn't get a leg up. And we were lamenting the colossal waste of human potential in that phenomenally rich country. And I thought to myself, apartheid is gone in the law in South Africa, but it is still alive in the heart of nearly everybody on earth in some way or another. 
And here is this man still giving of himself to try to take the apartheid out of the heart of the people of his continent and indeed the people of the world. We were talking just before we came down about a mutual friend of ours who's the leader of a country and how he had called and admonished him to try to work through a problem that he has had for too long. And uh, so I say, I have to say one thing that is slightly amusing about this. You know, now the President Mandela will probably get up here and make some crack about being an old man and how his time's running out and all that. The truth is, He's leaving office because he feels like he's about 25 years old again. <laughs> and uh, he's so happily married, he can't be troubled with all these boring affairs <laughs> of politics. This, this is, uh, it is, uh, but every, I must say it's the only time I've ever known him to misrepresent the facts, but that is, I'm sure, what is going on here. But I ask you to think about that. Every time Nelson Mandela walks into a room, we all feel a little bigger. We all want to stand up. We all want to cheer because we'd like to be him on our best day. But what I would say to you is there is a little bit of apartheid in everybody's heart. And in every gnarly, knotted, distorted situation in the world where people are kept from becoming the best they can be, there is an apartheid of the heart. And if we really honor this stunning sacrifice of 27 years, if we really rejoice in the infinite justice of seeing this man happily married in the autumn of his life, and if we really are seeking some driven wisdom from the power of his example, it will be to do whatever we can, however we can, wherever we are, to take the apartheid out of our own and others' hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of South Africa. President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton, Reverend Bernice King, distinguished guests and friends. When I turned 70, a young lady who is now principal of a leading university in my country, came to see me in prison. She was blunt and straightforward, did not flutter me. She didn't say, I came to see you here because of my interest in you. She said, if my father were alive today, he would have been 70. And when I read in the papers that you were turning 70 today, I thought I should come and see how a man of 70 looks like. <laughs> <clears throat> now I've turned 80. I suspect that many of you came here to see. <laughs> to see what a man of 80 looks like. <clears throat> no visit to the United States by a representative of the South African people would be complete 
without an opportunity to meet with those who are gathered here tonight. For us, probably on our last official visit to your country, it has special meaning and I most sincerely thank our host for making it possible. More than friends, we are among those on whom history has visited the same pains and deprivation and who have shared our victories. The founders of our liberation movement drew deep inspiration at the turn of the century from black America striving under difficult circumstances to fulfill our common aspiration for the restoration of human dignity. It is small wonder that the struggle to end apartheid drew such strength from here, or that we now look to you to work with us as we seek to banish poverty, hunger, illiteracy, and ignorance from our land. Mr. President, by embodying your identification with these shared aspirations in the program of your administration, you have won for yourself a warm place in the heart of the South African people, as you witnessed on your visit to our country earlier this year. We know that we have your understanding as we seek with the countries of the South to shift the world economic system towards the needs of the poor and the weak. We are aware of the national debate that is taking place in this country about the president. And it is not our business to interfere in this matter. But we do wish to say that President Clinton is a friend of South Africa and Africa. And I believe the friend of the great mass of black people and the minorities and the disabled of the United States. <clears throat> Few leaders of the United States have such a feeling for the position of the black people and the minorities in this country. often said that our morality does not allow us to desert our friends.
and we will not say tonight, we are thinking of you in this difficult and distressing time in your life. Two days ago, the president of Zambia, Frederick Chaluba, phoned me. Now, he is far younger than me. I think he's in his sixties. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, in meetings, he always speaks to me with uh, great respect. And sometimes when we don't agree, and he says, now look, I'm not convinced, Mr. President, of what you're saying. But in our custom, we never challenge an old man. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, he projected a new image two days ago when he phoned me. He did not make a request to me. He gave me an instruction. <laughs> and he said, uh, Madiba, I want you to support President Clinton. <clears throat> he was not speaking for himself. He was not speaking for himself, and he said so. He said, I'm speaking for the continent of Africa. addressed our parliament, he almost brought down the walls of that building <clears throat> when he said, we in the United States have been asking a wrong question. We have been saying, what can we do up for Africa? That was a wrong question. The right question was, what can we do with Africa? <laughs> that is the man my friend, who I respect so much, but he clearly is changing American foreign policy to the satisfaction of all those who accepted the United States as a world leader with the biggest economy in the world. And he is decisively changing American policy. We, I repeat that I will not interfere in the domestic affairs of this country. But you should have seen the way he was received by the General Assembly of the United Nations. <clears throat> the applause was spontaneous and overwhelming. All of us rose to our feet when he came in. It was the same after he delivered his speech. That sent a strong message as to what the world thinks on this national debate. The 
the men and women who were there come from every part of the globe. They are leaders of thoughts, presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers, and other opinion makers. That was the strong message they sent. If you judge from the reaction of the National Assembly, the United States is completely isolated on this question. <laughs> but if our expectations, if our fondest prayers and dreams are not realized, then we should all bear in mind that the greatest glory of living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time you fall. Yes.